Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. This episode is very exciting. We are going to talk about bees. More specifically, we will provide you with a Bees 101 introduction with cool information regarding their biology, evolution, and diversification. Then we will transition into global trends within native and domesticated bee populations with proper actions of involvement. And we finish the episode talking about our guest path to entomology and a touch about science communication. So speaking of our guest star, please meet Abby Lehner. Abby graduated with her master's in biology and is now pursuing a PhD in entomology. Her past projects have included comparing bee communities in native and restored sites in New York, as well as exploring how the bee community at Pinnacles National Park has changed over time. And she began science communication, as known as Entomology Abby, in 2020. She films and edits educational videos covering topics in entomology, ecology, conservation, life as a graduate student, and being a woman in STEM. So, now that you've been introduced to Abby and the topic of this podcast, we are going to head into our first segment. Enjoy. So, Abby, welcome to the show. It's so nice to be talking to you today. It's awesome to be talking to you, too. I'm so excited. Yeah. So, apparently, you just started your PhD program. How is that going so far? Are you, are you really excited? I am. I'm in the first week. Just met with my advisor today. So, so far, so good. We'll see how it goes. Awesome. Where are you studying? I study at UC Davis. Ooh, super exciting. Very, very smart. <laughs> and what's your, what's your focus, like, overall? So my PhD will be in entomology, and I'm interested in working with bees in urban environments and looking at how they're affected by urban heat waves. Well, that's extremely perfect for everything that we're going to be talking about today. And this segment, this first segment, we're literally just doing a sort of bees 101, an introduction to bees. And to get this kind of kick-started, we should start, I guess, with the the bare bones, right? Like. If, if I were to ask you the question, could you give me a clickbait answer of like, what, what are bees? <laughs> Very simple. Bees, yeah, that's a good question. Bees are fancy wasps is the answer I'd probably give you. Um, bees evolved from wasps originally. And so they share a lot of characteristics with wasps and really the only technical trait to tell apart a bee and a wasp is that bees have plumose branched hairs and wasps oh. do not. Interesting. Explain plumose branched for like the lay yeah, person. So, mm -hmm. Instead of just a straight hair, like the hair on your head, uh, yeah. it splits into a bunch of different ends. So they're fluffy, which is great for collecting pollen. The pollen kind of sticks to that like Velcro. Oh, okay. So kind of like maybe like a mop kind of like at the end where it just like has a bunch of dangly hairs. That's pretty cool. Exactly. Or if you had a, a really bad split end, something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so, okay. Um, we, we've established basically what bees are, but like they, okay, so they come from wasps, right? So that's kind of like the start of their evolutionary track. Uh, could you go into more detail on that and maybe explain how that how they've evolved over time? Because from my understanding is that they've been around since the early Cretaceous, right? Or am I exactly. wrong? Exactly. Oh, one yeah. for one. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. So bees were fully evolved uh, into the early Cretaceous period. So they were um, evolving from wasps slightly before that. They evolved from a special group of wasps called specifiform wasps. And these wasps were hunting insects called thrips. Thrips are very small insects that you find in flowers. Uh, they are pollinators themselves and they feed on pollen and nectar. 
and uh, they can also be a pest in some cases, but generally beneficial insect. So these wasps were hunting thrips, which is how pollen was getting introduced to their diet incidentally from eating the thrips because the thrips were consuming pollen. So eventually, falling down this line, uh, bees became essentially vegetarian wasps only consuming pollen and nectar, uh, with only one exception to that rule. So really neat evolutionary path, one of my favorites. And we just learned this fairly recently, the last 10 years or so about oh. bees. Wow, that's, that is very interesting. Um, and I also did a little bit of digging, so, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. And over, you know, the, I would say from a hundred, let's just say like, uh, put a tag on it, like 130 million years ago, cause that's obviously pretty variable and uh, on the scale of time, right. To about, uh, up to six, 40 to 60 million years ago, you saw a really big, boom like in terms of the types of bees because of um also the evolution of flowering plants am i right yeah so that is one really big aspect of insect diversity in general is their co-evolution with flowering plants it mm -hmm. allowed a lot of different insects to become specialized to different types of plants um, if they're consuming nectar and pollen and different mechanisms to get that nectar and pollen from the plant. So that's one of the factors that's led to quite a lot of bee diversity as well as competition. Oh, wow. That's that's really cool. Uh, I love the, the co-evolution stories. It's not just like cut and dry <laughs> in that manner. And, and um, you know, they they were pretty much seeking a different food source, right, to be able to get away from what wasps were doing. There was a niche that needed, I guess, in the most simplest terms, there was a niche that needed to be filled and then they filled it. But then because flowering plants were were diversifying at like absurd rates, they were able to continue to um, niche themselves down in different species to you know take upon this plant in this area or this plant in this area. So what a really cool track. Like <laughs> that's that's beautiful. It's like a a, a, a tree branch, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's even, you know, continued into more recent times. For example, bees in um, like Mediterranean climates or more desertic regions tend to be much more diverse uh, than other areas of the world, which is pretty unusual for animals as a whole. Like generally you see animals are more diverse in tropical regions and not so much in like the Nearctic, for example, and that's really not the case at all with bees. And we think it's because of that extreme competition of flowers in those types of regions, because they only bloom for a short amount of time, right? You only oh, see a bloom mm. in like a desert for a couple weeks, for example. So those, be, those bees have to be really, really closely intertwined with the flowers. So by specializing on different plants, which, you know, led to the diversification of bee species, you're also reducing the competition for that very short, like short lived resource, basically. Yeah. And that kind of makes me think if they're pray praying, they're feeding upon these certain uh, niche groups of, of, of flowering plants, and they're only around for a few weeks out of the year. Um, that would then also change the way that each individual bee type would go about, about their business through uh, creating whatever byproducts they do to um, facilita facilitate reproduction. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of bees have sort of unique traits, uh, you know, whether that is in reproduction, but also in feeding some uh, use floral oils, some go more for nectar, some go more for pollen, mm. um, some uh, include even like microbes and fungus into their diet. So oh, interesting. there's a lot of interesting, yeah, specializations. Mm. So we've, we've kind of hinted here that there's a lot of types of bees, right? So maybe because 
you know, the, the lay person, whenever they think about bees, the first thing that pops into their mind is like the honeybee or, <laughs> you know. Um, so maybe it would be cool to talk about some of your favorite types of solitary or native bees and just explain how many types of bees are out there as of we know, you know, rounding, of course, like, yeah. Yeah, so um, you're definitely right. The average person thinks of honeybees, maybe bumblebees also. Uh, yes. Um, but there are thousands of types of bees. So in North America, we have a little over 4,000 bee species in the world. There's a little over 20,000 bee species described. You know, there, there are <laughs> new species we're finding all the time. Uh, but the honeybee is really just one of those. And bees are very diverse in the forms they come in. You know, they're not all black and yellow. They don't all make honey, don't all live in a hive, uh, that sort of thing. You know, don't all sting after dying. Yeah, there's a lot of mm -hmm. common misconceptions associated with the honeybee because that's the most popular bee because of um, its necessity in agriculture. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. bees are really spectacular in uh, their diversity. They come in just about every color of the rainbow. Some nest in the ground, some are cavity nesting. So they'll nest in like logs or rocks or hollowed out plant stems. Some even nest in abandoned snail shells. So cute. What? Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> but my favorite bees are cuckoo bees. And cuckoo similar bees. to cuckoo birds, they're little thieves who go and lay their <laughs> eggs in other bees' nests. And then those bees hatch and eat all of the resources that the mama bee left for her and she, for her baby. Wow. And she, the bee will eat the, the other bee as well. So they're vicious little things, but so fascinating. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's not what, whenever you said they're so cute and then you like go on to say, oh, by the way, you know, <laughs> they just steal other, you know, other babies' homes and then just eat the babies and their resources, you know, that, that's, that's Devour cute. each other. It's adorable. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I have a favorite type of bee, but there, there was a bee, uh, species and maybe you can name it. I don't know, possibly, um, uh, but it's in California. Um, at least for the the documentary that I was I was watching, and these bees will go to a water source. They're usually at like a beach, like uh, along somewhere in in California, and they'll just go to the they'll go to the water and they'll suck in water into their abdomen. They'll take it back and they'll go to the cliff sides and they'll literally like spit the spit the water out and and claw out holes burrow holes into the cliff side and then you know do their reproduction process that way which is really really fascinating i think but they also um resemble like their body is similar to bumblebees so that they can like tell like predators like hey go away i'll sting you know i'll sting you but they actually are they don't have stingers at all they just mimic what bumblebees look like but like you can tell the difference of them by where the the stripes are on their on their bottoms which is really cool yeah there are actually um a handful of bees that have a similar behavior when they're nesting in a really hard packed surface for them to get water just to loosen it up so they can actually dig out the nest mm -hmm. um so i think the ones you're referring to are uh specific species of digger bee um, but okay. they have those really distinct bands um, mm. like bumblebees do yeah yeah uh, I, I wish i could remember if if only if i was an entomologist <laughs> I, <laughs> I wish I, I wish i knew uh it was it was literally a couple days ago whenever i was starting to get ready for this but oh well um so let me ask you this question what are some common misconceptions about bees that you feel like are important to communicate to someone like myself? Yeah, so um, <laughs> we did start to touch on some of the misconceptions about bees a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, first of all, I think it's just important to know how diverse bees are, right? They're not all honeybees. Honeybees were introduced to the United States from Europe for agricultural purposes. So they're not native here and they're actually harmful to native bees. Um, 
so then because of uh, their popularity in agriculture, there's a lot of traits specific to honeybees that get labeled for all bees. Um, for example, having a queen and living in a hive. Most bees are solitary, something like 70 to 80% of bees are solitary. They don't have queen, they don't live in a hive. Um, there are, are some varying levels of sociality within bees. You know, some will like live in a colony with their sisters, but have their own nest space, for example. But for the most part, they're solitary. And uh, most bees don't die after stinging. That's another uh, yes. trait known only to honeybees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because honeybees have these barbed stingers. So when it goes through your skin, it sticks. Um, and as they fly away or you smack them off of you or whatever, the part of their organs remain attached to the stinger and that's, mm -hmm. that's why they die. But most bees don't have a barbed stinger, so they could sting multiple times if they chose to. Some bees don't have stingers at all. Uh, and some bees have stingers that are so small they can't even go through your skin. Oh, um, I find that... Yeah, bees tend to be very friendly. People get really scared about their um, stings and whatnot, but I find that honeybees are actually probably the most aggressive bee, at least in my experience. Um, I've had my hand in a net, like, irritating the bees, and they're still not stinging me, generally. Interesting. Um, Imagine, yeah. imagine if uh, evolution in the grand scheme of things was actually pretty quick. You know, the honeybees would would end up like somehow evolving to not have a barb stinger attached to their like organs. <laughs> um, I know. Then it, it would really be painful. Like it keeps stinging you over and over again. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, and another thing that's also really important to point out is that there are differences in, in how, um, like the societies of these bees that have like colonies, right? Uh, mm -hmm. like in terms of the way that we've, I hate this, but the way that we've established this over time is that like, uh, certain, certain species are matriarchal versus patriarchal. And one thing that I've noticed is that bees are extremely matriarchal. Am I right? By saying that yeah yes. yeah <laughs> like the the males are based on just like reproduction purposes and like the females do everything yeah they are the mainstay it's it's pretty cool uh do you mind running through the roles really quick of like a like a, a colony of bees yeah so with a honeybee for example you have the queen so her two main jobs are laying eggs she lays all of the eggs for the colony and then um, using her pheromones to, communi to communicate to the colony um, the needs. So, oh, we need more food. We need to lay more eggs. We need to expand. We need to move locations, whatever it may be. Um, that's basically the queen's job. And then there are the worker bees. So these are all female bees. Mm -hmm. And throughout their lifetime, they have different jobs. So. When they first hatch, for example, they typically work in the bee nursery, let's say, to tend to the other um, bee larvae that are developing. Um, then they could become queen attendants or they might be focused on building new honeycomb. Um, and then later in their life, they will be going out to collect pollen and nectar for the hive. Then there are drones, which are the male bees. And the drones, uh, as you said, they don't really do too much. They're <laughs> hanging out around the hive. Um, they're there for mating with the queen. And, and that's, that's about it for the male bees. And they aren't even around all year long. They're, they're seasonal. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's the general structure of a honeybee colony. And the native bees sort of have different varieties. Honeybees are like as social as you can possibly get mm -hmm. and very few other bees are like that stingless bees um, have a similar social structure but then bumblebees are slightly less social so like the queen overwinters and builds a brand new colony herself each spring okay um versus um for example like orchid bees are what's called quasi-social so they have some you know, sisterly care together at the nest, but they don't have a queen that they serve, for example. 
Um, so there's sort of different levels of these jobs, let's say, in a colony, depending upon the species. Interesting. Why do you think we chose to go after honeybees for agriculture? Like, is it is it because that their colonies are much larger and have greater output? Or is it just or is it for some other reason that maybe is just underlying and never really communicated? So I think that there are a couple of big reasons why we choose to go for honeybees. One is that they're producing a product. Most oh, bee species yeah. don't make honey or enough honey to be farmed, at least like bumblebees, for example, make a little bit of honey. You can't farm it though. So honey, honeybees make honey and wax, which we use for a lot of different products. True. Um, as you mentioned, their large colony size is very conducive to pollinating a lot of plants. Mm. Um, and honeybees are really quite resistant to a lot of our poor agricultural practices. So um, pesticide use, they're quite resistant to. They're pretty resistant to monocultured areas. This is areas like massive areas covered in one crop you'll still see a load of honeybees in there but native bees can't survive just because there's no variety in the diet um mm -hmm. so those are the biggest reasons i would say that honeybees are so widely used in agriculture okay yeah that makes sense just wanted to get that out there so people knew why we actually chose to go with honeybees that makes sense yeah one last thing I want to talk about before we run into our first commercial break. Uh, I really enjoy the story of how <laughs> of how queens, you know, become queens. It's very, very interesting. Can you take me through that at all? Yeah. So um, it's nothing too uh, crazy. I mean, it's a, it's bizarre, I would say, but like um, they're just fed special food essentially so when the bee the queen bee lays her eggs they're all the same uh, and the ones that the colony decides will become queens are fed what's called a royal jelly it's like yeah. a specialized honey with different chemicals uh inside of it and this like triggers um let's say light switches inside of the bee that says okay i'm going to become a queen now um, even though all of these have those same genes, it's just those like light switches going on and off. Mm, okay. Okay. And I, if, if, from my understanding is that like, if multiple of these queen bees hatch at once, they'll like fight to the death and whoever <laughs> wins is queen. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's so gladiator. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> I love it, it. It is. A lot of bees have this um, type of fighting. You know, if a queen um, wants to take over another hive or if, um, you know, there's two queens in the same nest, they'll fight. It's pretty common in wasps as well. It's very, okay. it's brutal out there. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. So uh, the last thing, it, well, no, actually, I have a couple more things, if you don't mind. It, it's just, it's just curiosity kills the cat here. <laughs> Uh, so my understanding is that royal jelly is only, is it only consumed by the queen and that like every other, I guess, of the worker bees and the drones take on what's called, um, uh, it's like a bread. Is that, is that, is that right? Or do they all uh, indulge in, in this royal jelly? It wouldn't make sense based on the hierarchy. Yeah, so to my knowledge, only the queen bee gets royal jelly. Okay. And then other bees um, are fed, yeah, essentially what you said. It's like a pollen loaf, it's yeah. called, um, yeah. which is a mixture of pollen and nectar. Okay. I, I, read, a, I read a quick article. Um, I, I'll, I'll at least say it was sourced by Cornell, so it's not like, like crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, make sure you check your sources, by the way. Uh, so, uh, they were, were explaining in a bit of like a bit in the abstract before getting into the weeds was that the bread, uh, the pollen bread versus the Royal jelly, the pollen bread keeps the other, um, female bees, the worker bees sterile while, um, the Royal jelly, uh, doesn't like typically do that. Um, <clears throat> which is, which is interesting, uh, kind of a dynamic. 
chemically? Yeah. So in eusocial insects, sort of one of the defining traits, let's say, is that they have these um, separation of jobs. They, they have a caste system. And typically those different jobs are reflected with changes in the physical appearance of the insect as well. So uh, in this case, it's an internal change, but the mm -hmm. queen bee um, needs to not be sterile, obviously, because she's laying lots of eggs. <laughs> right. Um, but honeybees have essentially given up their ability to reproduce for the good of the hive. Mm -hmm. Honeybees are altruistic, which is one of the traits um, required to be eusocial. So they will, you know, die for the good of the colony. It's essentially almost like when you think of a hive it's like one organism right mm. rather than a bunch of little ones with their own mind right that's like where the hive mind comes from uh that they uh, are like all that. working for the good of the colony rather than the good of the individual mm. what great nationalistic propaganda <laughs> <laughs> i had yeah. to go there <laughs> uh, okay so what do you see as like i'm, I'm sure this obviously uh, fluctuates a good amount based on the vast majority of um, these different species of bees. How much, like, how, what is their footprint of pollination? Oh, like, oh, oh yeah, oh. like, it's kind of hard to on average it, but like, any numbers that, do you have any numbers that you, that you know of? Yeah, so um, it's really, really common to hear, oh, bees are responsible for one third of the food that we eat. So this is not exactly correct okay but it's not a terrible <laughs> terrible estimation bees contribute in some way to about 35 percent of the food we're consuming um not all of these plants are completely only pollinated by bees but they do contribute quite a lot to the food that we eat um, especially because they're pollinating a lot of our nutrient dense foods like fruits and vegetables um, versus mm -hmm. stuff like rice or wheat or corn. It's wind pollinated. It doesn't need bees. Right. Um, bees also can help pollinate these self pollinated plants um, just by spreading pollen a bit more. Um, it can increase their yields a little bit. Um, sure with cotton as well. So our clothing too, bees contribute mm -hmm. a little bit to that, nothing crazy, but yeah, somewhere around 35%-ish, um, give or take, you know, what right. crop it is, let's say. They're, gotcha. they're very helpful to us. And also the honey and wax industries are massive, massive industries in agriculture. Billions that make, of dollars. I think billions, yes. <laughs> wow, that's... That's insane. Also, shout out to the other pollinators, man, like <laughs> the butterflies, <laughs> the mosquitoes, the flies, et cetera. <laughs> Give I know. them some credit. The, the poor, poor pollinators, other pollinators who don't get any credit <laughs> for all the hard work they do. That's right. I was going to ask about the waggle dance just because I think that's so fascinating. The fact that their directionality is relative to the sun, which is so, so awesome. Um, I was going to ask about that and then also ask a question onto that. If honeybees were the only uh, species of bees that do the waggle dance, or if this is like a common occurrence for anything that has a social structure of any kind. Um, bees are the uh, honeybees are the only ones that do it to my, to my knowledge. Interesting. Interesting. Something that's, do you find that they're like the domineering bee? because of all of these advanced capabilities? Or do you just think that we over, we give them that crown just because of agriculture? Like if agriculture didn't exist, do you think that they would be a domineering species? Yes, we have okay. been infatuated with honeybees since like ancient Egypt times. Mm. You know what I mean? There's like portraits, they're very ingrained in culture. But again, they are still producing honey, and that is something that people were using then as well. So it's hard to say, like, if agriculture didn't exist, we we were getting a product for them for the entire existence of mankind. I think very true, very <laughs> um, true. But I think that 
people find them quite charismatic because of how unique they are. They're rather friendly. They're fuzzy. Yeah, I mean, for like an insect, they're quite cute, I would say, compared yeah. to um, a lot of the <laughs> other things that a lot of the other types of insects, right? So, so fair. Um, yeah. But people have definitely been drawn to uh, honeybees and stingless bees for mm. for ever um and both of those produce honey so that's right well on that note we're going to go into a commercial break but when we come back we're going to talk about some interesting news and global trends so stick around all right we're back here this is segment two and abby and i will mostly abby because she's the expert but <laughs> we're going to be talking about the global trends what we're seeing with bee populations and we thought that we would start you know at home with everyone and then branch out to native bees so we're going to talk about honey bees at first that way you can kind of get um, a sense of what's going on and then branch out so you get a better understanding of the full picture so abby would you like to take it away and talk about some of the things that we're seeing with honeybee populations yeah, so I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with colony collapse disorder, which um, was a big issue facing honeybee hives in agriculture and sort of where the save the bee movement stemmed from, let's say. And um, honeybees face a variety of issues due to domestication. So because they're being used in agriculture as agricultural animals they face issues with diseases um just like a chicken would for example you know chickens have newcastle and salmonella and these tend to just be bred into the chickens because they're all in one area there's a lot of them so it's the same type of thing with honeybees in apiaries varroa mites are the biggest issue that honeybees are facing on one of the causes of colony collapse disorder mm -hmm. so varroa mites are parasites that are feeding on the honeybees and uh, this can lead to the death of the hive ultimately and it's a really big problem that beekeepers and apiaries and agricultural areas were all facing are they um are they now in australia the like whenever i wrote that research blog i was telling you about they weren't in Australia, at least at the time of the report that I was reading. Are they in Australia now? Because obviously they're they're not in Antarctica, but like I've heard that they're in every other major continent. Uh, so I'm 99% sure, yes, that they're in oh. Australia as well. Oh, darn. I, sorry, I was trying to throw some good news in there. <laughs> oh, darn. I could be wrong, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, let's let's hope that Abby's wrong, but uh, I I believe I believe in her in that in that manner. Um, yeah, no, uh, varroa mites are a very interesting case, right? Because they not only ride the backs of bees, but they also spread based on bee reproduction. They'll be like encapsulated with the larvae, right? And then they'll like feed and attach to the larvae, and then whenever the larvae come out of the wax cap, then the varroa mites still stick onto the bee, but then also go everywhere. <laughs> so it's like a, it's a crazy infestation in the hive and then also in the individual bee. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're very, very small, so it's easy for them to multiply and spread and stick on to the bees. So mm -hmm. they're quite a difficult pest to get rid of. Yeah. It, so in, I know with conventional agriculture, uh, the one obvious way to combat having lots of um, individuals, let's say side by side working together in small square square area is to use introduce pharmaceuticals. Is that something that they're trying to do with bee populations as well? I'm sure that there's some sort of a feedback in on that as well. I mean, there's there's feedback between how, you know, it's affecting like our our meals and our bodies. I don't know if it's also doing the same thing through bee populations. Do you know anything about that? So um, how the pharmaceuticals in are, yeah. the crop industry are affecting honeybees? Oh, no. Just like are they introducing pharmaceuticals to slow down the rate of transmission of different viruses? Like, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that's okay. I just misunderstood. Nice. Um, so yes, uh, there are a variety of treatments that are used for varroa mites. Some of these are like targeted pesticides, essentially, and some are um, mm. medications. My understanding is that they have varied effectiveness. Um, some small beekeepers struggle a lot with varroa mites, constantly killing their hives. Um, and other groups seem to have success with it. So I think it has mixed abilities. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The, the, <laughs> there's a uh, uh, different causalities, different effects between how we utilize pharmaceuticals and, and agriculture. Um, most of the time, uh, I'll just throw out, this is my opinion that it's, it's not really good. <laughs> not really. Uh pharmaceuticals definitely need to be used with care and caution I would say. yeah no i agree so how about this um i have it i have it written down here so don't mind if i look over the neo the neonicotinoids neo mm. neonicotinoids neonicotinoids yes are, are you familiar with those do you mind explaining that yeah, so neonicotinoids are a type of pesticide that are used very commonly, both in agriculture as well as like ornamental plants. So like trees that you will see in a median in a parking lot, for example, um, they're really commonly treated with neonicotinoids. Okay. Um, they're a very serious pesticide. <laughs> they kill everything like they really mean it. Um, and then these will leach into the soils and if bees are nesting in the soil for example um, we've seen with bumblebees that neonicotinoid exposure can uh, reduce their ability to learn and their memory capabilities um, if it you know isn't outright killing the insect um, it can have really adverse effects on their capabilities wow well that's interesting um my a uh, thousand foot overview understanding of that is that ne neonicotinoids were a approved uh, substitute for DDT. Yes, but my other favorite pesticide. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be batting a batting a thousand here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, haven't heard good things about either of those. A DDT is is. I think it's told. Is it is it phased out? I, I thought it was kind of illegal to use DDT. I don't know about globally, but at least in the United States, that's not used anymore. Correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Um, Praise so, the Lord! It was killing literally everything. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. I. I bet. So, what are uh, the different like human effects? Obviously, other than agriculture, that are affecting honeybees, or is that mainly just a? Uh, is that mainly just an effect on native bees for what we do, like human to human, or like industrially? Oh, okay. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, so honeybees obviously are not really affected by habitat loss because they're not native uh, in the United States, at least. Um, so habitat loss is a really big factor that's affecting native bees. Um, we're seeing pretty strong trends of uh, bee diversity decline in agricultural and urban areas. Um, so that's quite a big issue that native bees are facing that honeybees in the united states at least don't really um, pesticide use is something that affects both groups mm -hmm. honeybees are i would say more resilient to pesticide use than native bees that's for a couple of reasons um, one is that they're not nesting in the ground so all those pesticides mm -hmm. that are getting soaked into the ground those don't really affect honeybees that affects you know the other 70 something percent of bees that are nesting in the ground Okay. Um, and you'll actually see like the higher a pesticide is like the concentration in the ground, the less likely you are to see bees. They'll follow a gradient very simply of pesticide mm. use. Makes sense. Um, and then climate change is the next big factor. Right? Uh, everyone's so, favorite topic. <laughs> yes. 
this is definitely something I would say is affecting native bees more than honeybees. Again, just because of that introduced aspect. I mean, honeybees mm -hmm. are never going to go extinct. They're managed by people. That's not the same case for, for native bees. So um, climate change affects bees in a couple of different ways. One is potentially decreasing their ranges, right? So if it gets too hot in mm -hmm. an area where they need, you know, a particular temperature, they might be moving further north, further north until it gets too cold, and then their range will end up shrinking. This is something we pretty commonly see in bumblebees in particular. Um, it can cause fall emergence like emergences of the bees so it'll get too warm in the fall and that will trigger the bee to think oh it's it's spring time to come out and begin my life um and then there will be a frost the next week so mm. you know it'll kill them or any eggs that they laid interesting um and then uh extreme weather events caused by climate change obviously cause issues with the drought um you know flowers won't emerge when they're supposed to and then there will be this like temporal mismatch between the bee and the flower they're missing the flowers that they're supposed to be feeding on that type of thing even wildfire devastation too increased wildfires yeah wildfires um really extreme ones can have really negative effects on bees yeah yeah um so that's you know one one thing that maybe uh, is just might be a dumb question i don't know but um i know some species biologically are affected like their reproduction is affected by temperature is bee are there bee species that are also being affected by temperature increase yeah that's a great question so uh in terms of reproduction we don't really know um mm -hmm. bee egg production in native bees at least is actually not that well studied okay. um so we are not really completely sure about the survivability of eggs in heat waves for example and that's something that i'm hoping to look at actually in my doctoral hey. dissertation is <laughs> looking at how um bees are affected by these extreme heat events and whether they can survive them or if it kills them interesting so three major maybe four major things um that we have highlighted that impact honeybees and also intertwine with native bees um climate change of course varroa mites neonicotinoids and then the influence of human activity that has that is outside of agriculture so um one thing that we didn't really touch on is how we structure our properties lawns you know so to speak we uh we for some reason back in the 60s there was a movement that in the fertilizer industry that said people in the united states that have um you know it's a certain type of lawn, like a certain profile of a lawn is poor. Like for example, clovers or native flowers. Uh, it was associated that you were poor if you just grew what was there. And that has had an absolute killer effect, literally killer effect to native bee populations. Would you like to add on to that? Or maybe, I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I hit it. Uh, yeah, on the head you did a great job explaining it. So, um, there's a lot of issues with the way that we develop, um, you know, our urban areas, our suburbs, um, and our houses. So um, one is the concrete covering everything, right? There's nothing really living in sidewalks, roads, these types of things. Um, and then as you're talking about sort of the lawn culture, um, mm. because these are non-native turf grasses that we're using for a lawn we're mowing them so that's cutting any sort of flower that would even attempt to grow right uh, they're getting sprayed with pesticides often and we're using up all types of water that we shouldn't be using in the middle of desert areas i'm looking at you las vegas don't even get me started about arizona <laughs> arizona is just as bad like i drive to work yeah. i'm not going to say where i work or where i drive but i drive to work and there's sprinklers on at 3 p.m 
And it's like, yo. And it, also, don't even get me started about golf courses. It just, just, don't, just don't even get me. Whole nother topic someday. I'm going to do like a water consumption uh, episode. And we will talk about golf courses. <laughs> 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 yeah. So let's, I think we should just finish out this segment and talk about some positive things, right? Cause we've been explaining a lot of negative things. Um, but I mean, obviously like we discussed before we jumped into the segment is that yes, it is, you know, kind of a down in the dumps portion of the episode, but like, it's just super important for the individual to realize what's going on, you know, where it, it affects the way that you make decisions moving forward, you know, to know like how your lawn is impacting things or what, or who you could vote for that would change the way we do agriculture in that manner, or who you could, who you could vote for both locally, state level, you know, federal that would do things for agriculture and climate change and transportation, how we set up our urban cities or our urban societies. So I digress on that. Let's, let's talk about something that's a little more positive. Um, other than like voting and being informed, Abby, what do you recommend that like the individual like myself could do to um, help positively impact bee populations? Yeah, there are a lot of really simple things that you can do um, to help support bees. So um, we're essentially trying to put more diversity back into the area that you're living, right? So uh, rather than having these green lawns with only one non-native grass species, planting some native plants. And it doesn't have to be, you know, go all in and start filling up your whole yard with native plants. You can start really simple with planter boxes, window planters, potted native plants. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really simple way to start providing some habitat and food for native pollinators. Um, then uh, if you're not into gardening, there's the option of a bee hotel as well, um, which, you know, you can make them yourself or you can purchase one. And those will attract some native cavity nesting bee and wasp species that will come and use it as a nesting resource. Um, of course, writing your reps and voting, as you mentioned, are really great ways to get involved um and yeah. also just teaching other people about it letting them know saying hey um you know native pollinators are important here's what you can do in your yard spreading the word um and spreading it to organizations that you're in for example um like at a school i was at i really advocated for native plants to be put into our local little garden rather than the ornamental plants that they were putting in and a lot of the times you'll go to these like board meetings and say, hey, here's what I think we should do. And they'll even say, oh, you know, I never thought of that. That's a great idea. We will do that. You know, it's very simple to make a difference a lot of the time. It's just putting mm -hmm. forth a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of really great things you can do. Even in an apartment building, like having window planters, that all will help native bees. I don't really like doing this, but I'm going to do it anyways. So I'm going to shamelessly plug <laughs> my research blog. So um, I have a different, I have like four different research blogs out right now. One's for reduce, reuse, recycling. One's for the efficacy of, of having trees around in the environment. So it's just called plant a tree. The other one is rightfully called save the bees. Um, and then also one on commercial fishing. And the idea behind it is to have like a t-shirt with an emblem where the emblem is like a B on it and on like the sleeve of the t-shirt is a QR code. If you scan the QR code, it goes right to that research blog. So you are intertwined with, you know, your, your symbol of what you want to promote and what you want to learn about. So if anybody's interested in, in learning a little bit more um, or just getting different sources about bees, then be sure to check that out. Cause I, I never get to plug that stuff. So I'm, I'm doing it here. <laughs> Yeah, it's really cool. As you should. Yes, absolutely. So um, I don't know if I have anything else to add to this. Do you have anything else to add before we jump into our last commercial break and we get into segment three? Mm, no, I think I'm okay. Sweet. Okay. 
shamelessly plugged that was the end i just i just killed it <laughs> sorry about that out there but if you do check it out i would appreciate it you gotta do what you gotta do all right we're gonna conclude this segment and we're gonna run into segment three where we're gonna wrap up and talk about we i labeled it as the mishmash of bees and abby so stick around <laughs> for that <laughs> yes this is our last segment finally if you stuck around this long, I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. There's been a, a lot of interesting information thrown out there, both not daunting, but um, very informative and very interesting, in, in my opinion. Like if you're a layperson like me, just having an appreciation for bees. So, this last segment, we're going to talk about Abby and her contributions and her studies in entomology. So, Abby, what, first of all, let's start, what was your path to entomology? Why did you even choose to get into this field in the first place? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say I'm not a typical entomologist in the way that I got into the field. A lot of people grew up, you know, loving bugs and always being interested in them. I hated bugs growing <laughs> up. Okay, I thought like creepy crawly things really gave me like the heebie-jeebies that I did not like them at all um and then when i was in high school i was taking my biology course and we were actually required to do an insect collection as part of our class which is pretty unusual i think for a high school biology class um and we you know were running around outside collecting bugs with our hands and um it was a lot for someone who didn't really like bugs that much, mm -hmm. but I found I really, really liked it when we took them back home to identify. And when, you know, the insect is dead and you can actually look at all of its interesting features to figure out what it is um, and what family it's in. It's like I was noticing things that I had never noticed before with insects mm -hmm. so that's what first kind of piqued my interest and okay. when i went to undergrad um i majored in biology and at first i was like oh i'll probably go into like pharmaceutical synthesis or some cutting edge genetic technology thing <laughs> uh, and i took a few chem classes a few intro bio classes and i was like Mm, actually, I like plants and bugs. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I've sort of stuck with it. I started at first working in a fruit fly lab studying evolution. So okay. I was looking at like the speciation between two sister species of fruit flies. Um, and eventually I migrated my way over to bees and I've stuck with them. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I think bees are like an easy insect to get attracted to. Like they're so, I mean, I hate to take it away from all the other insects. They're all really interesting. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but like, I don't know, bees are just, they just hit home for some reason. They're, they're very interesting. Yeah. Cool. No, that's really cool. So what are, so you said you worked in a flute, a fruit fly. Wow. A fruit fly lab. It's been a long day. <laughs> It's been a long day. Uh, what are you working on? What do you plan to work on now specifically in your PhD track? Yeah, so my work is going to be focused on pollinator ecology. I'm really interested in how bees use space. So I'm hoping to look at how extreme climatic events like heat waves affect bees and affects where they're nesting and where they're gathering food from. Interesting, interesting. So um, where are you gonna be taking your data from? Are you gonna be doing it locally or are you gonna be doing something that's a little more national and or global? Um, so I'll definitely be doing some experiments at the local scale and then okay. um, I have potential to expand it um, you know, in the state of California or through the Pacific Northwest. So we'll see how, uh, where the road takes me, I suppose. That's fair. So would you say that, that um, entomology, but specifically studying bees, 
has a lot of information or do you think that there's not a lot of um, data sources to go off of as an entomologist? Yeah, that's a really good question. So honeybees are very, very well studied, again, because of their importance in agriculture. But mm -hmm. native bees have sort of slipped through the cracks, I feel like, in terms of available information. Compared to a lot of other animals, we really don't know that much about native bees, which is really strange considering how important they are. Um, but yeah, there's a really big need for more information. Well, definitely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can't make any claims without, well, I, I, sorry, we're in the wrong, we're in the wrong time frame to be saying that. <laughs> Never mind. Let, me, <laughs> let me retract. <laughs> Backtrack. <laughs> yeah, uh, people make a lot of claims without any without any data behind it. But no, that's that's good. That's good that you're also uh, contributing to um, the the data, the lack thereof of data, which is which is good. Um, yeah, specifically because whenever I even asked the question earlier about like the does temperature affect um, sexual reproduction, it there's there's not a lot to be said there. So that's really good. And, and that's also really fruitful for people who are coming up in biology and don't really know a direction to go towards, you know, because, you know, when you think about biology as a whole, you think of it as being something that's extremely flooded. Um, but then there's these niche categories within biology that just really need attention because if we don't have native bees or not don't, if, if, if bees start to disappear more and more, that's, that's a, a big red flag. That's a scary red flag. That's like, geez, that's like a monumental red flag. <laughs> yeah. Come to entomology. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, um, we have enough engineers. Go, go study, go study bees. <laughs> we med biology students. Okay. Only entomologists from here on out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there are a lot of you out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Abby, do you have any like um, like lasting advice for people who are uh, pursuing entomology or for people who are even just doing science communication like yourself? I mean, do you want to like talk about your science communication really quick? Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. I started doing SciComm on TikTok in 2020. It was a little COVID hobby for yeah. me at first. <laughs> Um, had a lot of spare time on my hands. I was like, oh, let's make videos for TikTok. This will be fun. And I remember specifically thinking before my first video, like, oh, am I going to try and, you know, do what everyone else is doing and follow all the same trends? Um, or can I take this trend and can I make it about bees? I think that would be hilarious. <laughs> and so it just started from there. And I, people liked it i don't know why to be honest i mean i just felt like um it did well and i had my first ever viral video where um i was singing lizzo's boys uh but made it bees and was singing uh showing different different bees you know I nice like big bees itty bitty bees yep it was <laughs> it was great <laughs> um and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I've stuck with it and um, also expanded over to Instagram. Um, and I've had some really amazing collaborations. I was um, sponsored in 2022 by Hank Green to create science content. Um, and I've had some brand partnerships. So it's all been like really great and fun. And I think it's very important to get into science communication mm -hmm. as a scientist, because what's the point in doing the science if no one's going to learn about it? Exactly. I, I totally agree. We need to drop <laughs> the whole idea of um, gatekeeping information because people who do science like to use really, really big terms and make uh, papers at such a high uh, status of of intellect rather than talking down to the people that are really, you know, that are seeking the information. Like, of course, like it's easy 
for an entomologist to entomologist to read an entomology paper, but not for someone like me who studies physics and engineering to go, you know what, I really like bees. I want to learn about solitary bees. And, you know, you look it up and you're like, what the hell is going on here? Um, I think it's good to just, it's good that we have science communication because it's taking away that gatekeeping and it's putting information out there. So people are, are definitely more informed and, and less in the dark. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we're in a, a misinformed world at the moment. I don't know. One of the reasons, there's just plenty of reasons, but that's one of them. Yeah. I mean, it's hard when there's so much content and information available to sift through it and say what's good and, and what's not good. I mean, it's, it's not an easy skill to develop. So I think like having science communicators who are reliable and consistently, you know, show mm -hmm. where they're getting their information and why they're saying the things that they're saying, it's really important. I agree. So did, I'm just curious, just because I'm a big uh, Hank Green fan, uh, Hank and John, yeah. they're, <laughs> they're awesome people. I love them. I talk about them all the time. Um, how did that happen? Did he, he just like reached out to you on Instagram or what? Yeah. yeah, he just sent me a message on TikTok. Um, he had followed me a while ago, um, sometime in 2021. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe like Hank Green has watched my science videos. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? And yeah. then he messaged me and said, you know, that him and John and their Vlog Brothers channel, um, all of the revenue that's raised for that half of it goes to charity and the other half goes to supporting small uh, content creators. Wow. So something like eight or nine people received sponsorships from him, like um, Black Forager, if you know her, Alexis. Mm -mm. Um, she got a sponsorship, but nice. so there's, or um, the Garbage Queen, Elena. There's a couple oh, of really yeah. cool people, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, that's awesome. Uh, wow, I, I honestly just started science communication I guess last year, uh, but more heavily this year, specifically because I just, I moved out here to Arizona from Pennsylvania and, you know, I needed some things to do and I just really enjoy it. Um, one thing that, that got me started was, you know, realizing the misinformation uh, complexity through the pandemic, but also I really, really enjoy teaching my nieces things whenever I'm around them. And I'm like, you know what? I have a physics background. I have an engineering background. I love to read just different papers. I love to read books about different sciences, et cetera. Why, why am I not like projecting this stuff? Um, and then I got into it. Now I'm more into TikTok. I'm starting to build on TikTok. It's, it's slow. It's very slow, especially if you don't do a lot of the, the clickbaity um, trends and stuff. I don't. I try to keep it you know, either reaction videos or just like interesting topics that I think are cool or that people reach out to me to do. But yeah, I've only been doing it for so long, but man, it's it's fun. And it can be quite rewarding to get like, just even people comment and be like, that was a really cool video. Like, like I never knew that, you know, that's, it's good stuff. Well, I mean, and even on TikTok, for example, let's say your video gets a hundred views. Okay. It feels like, oh, that's not that many views. When you think about sitting in a room and speaking to a hundred people, like it that's seems fair. like quite a lot more, you know what I mean? It's like, you are getting your word out there. Even if you're, you feel like you don't have that many views. Like that to me, that that part's not that important. How many views it has. Cause somebody's going to hear it. And that's, what's important. That's one person. That's a very good perspective that I have not heard yet. Because I think today in how we do things like on social media, we're so worried about the likes, the comments, the shares, the views. And, you know, it should be more about did I create quality content? And are, you know, are you satisfied with, you know, not even are you satisfied, but like you, you produce quality content to whomever wants to indulge in it. So that's a good one. I like that. It's really good. Do you have any lasting advice for anyone now since we talked about your cyclone? Oh, yeah. I forgot yes. about that. Oh, you're good. <laughs> you're good. Oh, if you want to become an entomologist, it's a tricky one. Um, 
I don't know. I would say just follow your passion and kind of see where it takes you. I wouldn't be rigid in saying I need to live in this state or I for sure want to work with only this insect. Like, you know, when you're a bit more open minded about these kind of things, a lot of different opportunities can come to you that you never even knew were possible, I feel like. I love that. No, that's good. That's a good way, I think, to end this episode. Abby, this has been really good. Like, I, I really enjoyed this episode. I got to actually ask a lot of questions. Um, sorry for all of them, but. <laughs> no, I no, loved it, was, it. It was so fun. It was great. No, it was good. And, and actually, to anybody who is watching or listening to this, this is the first time that Abby and I have conversed. So other than just, you know, through Instagram DMs, this is the only way that we have conversed. And this was, this was a great episode. So Abby, thank you for coming on to the podcast. I appreciate it. That is all for this episode of Everything Steam. Now I'd like to give a big shout out to Abby for taking her time to share some expertise in a niche field of entomology surrounding bees. If you love science, entomology, and cool content, I recommend you give Abby a follow like I did on TikTok and Instagram. The links to do so will be in the description or on our website, everythingsteam.org. Or heck, just search Entomology Abby on those platforms. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make the show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, marketed by Courtney Page, QC'd by Panny Pit Erickson, and our episode art was manifested by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We are always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against the algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and just fun Steam content. Just search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on that fun. Once again, thank you for listening to Everything Steam. I am your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious.